scholar and you work when you're a scholar and you work so closely with with texts you get really involved in the details and you sometimes lose sight of the bigger picture um, he, he actually fumbled a little bit and he, he ended up saying um, um, that Maimonides was so radical and he also ended up saying that Maimonides was um, an, uh, an Aristotelian. Okay, but you know, these are things that are known about Maimonides and it's not clear why those things are, are so, um, so important. So that question is the question that has um, really been at the heart of my study of Maimonides over the years. Um, I wanted to be able to answer that question. It seemed like a really important question. We had to be able to say, really, what is so important about Maimonides? It's true, he said many radical things, no question about it. But what's interesting, and, and other scholars have noticed, is that he wasn't the first to say these very, very radical things. If you're um, steeped in Torah and rabbinic Judaism, you would probably be very surprised to see how Jewish philosophers um, even you know, very familiar ones like Sa'ja Gaon in the 10th century or Yehuda Halevi in the 11th and 12th century, how they talked about God in a way that's virtually unrecognizable to us. Um, the God with whom we're familiar, the God to whom we pray and who's our parent, our judge, and with whom we've had a long and fraught history is virtually absent from the discourse of these Jewish philosophers. And in fact, um, if not absent, he's, he's, God is totally reconfigured, uh, beyond recognition, perhaps. And uh, what, what really drives this um, reconfiguration of God, what, why he's uh, stripped of these characteristics that we normally associate with him, is the notion of divine unity. This is a philosophical idea that um, has really driven very dramatic uh, rethinkings of what God is, and in fact, what God must be if he's God. So, for example, um, just to bring this home, if, if you ask yourselves, what do you mean when you say the Shema? What do you mean when you say, uh, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad? What do you mean by the Lord our God, the Lord is one? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by one? Okay, so this is an interesting issue. I think the first thing we mean is that God's the only one. There is no other true God besides our God. I think probably that's the most standard understanding of it. Um, perhaps a secondary understanding of it is that God is unique, incomparable. Okay, so like more like miyuchad, special, that kind of thing. But that's not what the philosophers meant, mean by God's unity. When they say Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, what they mean is that God is internally simple. Okay, that is that he has no parts, no divisions within. Okay, it has nothing to do with his relationship to anything outside, but purely about what he is internally speaking. Um, the way you and I are one, or a table, or a, or a chair is one, is that we are a unified composition. We are made up of parts, uh, and together we form a unit. But God isn't like that. God doesn't have parts. God doesn't have body. So of course, for that reason alone, he doesn't have parts. And also there's no one around who could put him together, so to speak. So, um, so this idea of God's unity, what we, we philosophers called um, his radical simplicity, okay, so that he's, he's not divisible at all, that has driven some rather astonishing conclusions uh, for, the, for the Jewish philosophers, and of course, for Maimonides, as we'll see in a moment. Um, of course, you know, in saying that God is internally one, unified, having no parts, of course, there's some kind of um, dissing of the Christian idea of the Trinity, but it goes way beyond that. Um, taking this notion to heart, Sa'aja, as well as Yehuda Halevi and Maimonides, um, just deny the truth of most of the things we say about God. Because as soon as we say that God is this, that, or the other, we are multiplying him. We are making him more than one. And you know, even to say he's wise or, or merciful or any of those things, all of those things divide him and make it impossible for him to be this unified um, and simple being that they assume that he is. 
So Sajjah, for example, um, he says there are things we think about God, that he has these three attributes of life, power, and wisdom. And what he does is he says, well, we don't have a word for all of those three things together, but we don't want to divide up God. So there's really, there's really only one thing, but we don't have the language for it. And what he does is then he reduces those three attributes to one. And he says, God is a creator. Okay, because creator involves having all of those three attributes. But then he says, when we say God is a creator, what we mean is that there's a world that was created by him. In other words, Saja removes the, the attribute from God himself and places it on the world. There's a world that was created by God, but we don't want to say anything about God. In fact, Saja says that anything we say about God is to be understood metaphorically or figuratively. And the fact is that the only thing we know for sure about God and the only thing we can say with 100% confidence is that God exists. Beyond that, anything we say is suspect. Then the thing that Maimonides is most famous for, which is negative theology, um, we find that already in Yehuda Halevi. He says, when we say God is, God exists, we mean he isn't dead. <laughs> when we say he's one, we mean he isn't many. Okay, and we can only say the negative. If we were to dare to say the positive, we would then have to stop ourselves um, and say, no, 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 but not in, any, not in any way that's like anything else. Okay, so, so we, we automatically have to say, that God is not those things the way we understand them, the way we mean them. So, um, and, and oh, this is also very interesting, I think. Um, Yehuda Halevi says that to say that God is merciful is about us. If we're having a good day, <laughs> we'll say God is merciful. What do we mean when we say God is wrathful? We mean we're having a bad day, <laughs> okay? That he, he won't allow those, those um qualities to be assigned to God himself, they're all about us, okay? Just as Sa'adja removed him from God and put it on the world, so he does, uh, Yehuda Levi does virtually the same thing. Maimonides, no doubt, says these things more boldly and more radically than other philosophers, but he basically says the same thing. In um, book one, chapter 54 of The God of the Perplexed, Maimonides really um, goes out on a limb and he says that there is no relation between God and anything else. Okay, I mean, I hope that's startling to you. There's no relation between God and anything else. Why is that? Well, what Maimonides explains is that God is in a category by himself. And in order for, for something to be related to something else, they at least have to be in the same category in some way. But God is not in the same category as us in any way. So to say that God is whatever is like saying the wall sees. Okay, of course, it's not true that the wall sees, but it's worse than not true, right? Um, if you say the wall is made of brick when it's made of stone, that's false. But to say the wall sees, that's a different thing. That's a different kind of error. It's a different kind of falsehood. And it's what we call a category mistake, okay? That means you've crossed categories illegitimately. You've said about a wall things that cannot be said of it, not simply the wrong thing or the false thing or the untrue thing, but something that cannot be said about a wall. Okay, so we've applied the category of seeing or not seeing to something to which it doesn't apply. And what Maimonides says is that every time we talk about God, we have crossed categories. We have gone from him who is in a category by himself to categories that don't apply to him at all. We have committed a category mistake. Every time we use the same word for God and for anything else, we are equivocating, absolutely equivocating. That is, we are using the same word in two completely different senses. Okay, the way maybe we would say bowl and bowl. You know, they don't mean anything like each other. Okay, go bowling and a bowl of fruit. We use the same word, but they don't mean the same thing. And Maimonides goes so far as to say that's the case with God as well. Any attribute that we apply to God, that we apply to anything else, um, we've, we've said something untrue, okay? And, and something um, that crosses categories in that in illegitimate way. And more than that, 
um, Maimonides says that anything we say about God, um, we have to speak in our own uh, concepts. We have to use our own conceptual framework. And our concepts are so limited that, of course, necessarily anything we say about God is going to be false. Okay, so what we have here is a, a very stark and radical Maimonides saying that there's nothing positive we can say about God. And of course, it follows from that pretty quickly that there's nothing we can really say we know about God. But, you know, it, as, as I'm trying to point out, he's just saying more boldly what his predecessors have already said. And so I can't really say that um, this is what makes Maimonides so important and so special. And so um, what I'm trying to argue tonight is that what makes him so important is this idea that he had of the intellectual love of God. Okay, in other words, um, he thought that the point of human existence was to get as close to God as is humanly possible. And the only way to do that is via the intellect. The way we love God is via the intellect. Okay, so, uh, for example, if we think about the Shema, the Ba'ahafta part of the Shema, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. What Maimonides understands by that is that you should develop your intellect as far as you can. And in that way, get close to God. That's love. That's love of God. Developing your intellect to its greatest height, that's love of God. And there is no love of God that has to do with feeling. Okay, well, this brings us to Aristotle. We'll just have to talk about Aristotle for a little bit so we understand why Maimonides would say such a thing as this, that God is, the only way to get close to God is via the human intellect developed to its highest degree. So turning to Aristotle for a moment, um, he's really the root of all philosophical ideas about God. He believed that God was a first mover, okay, sometimes called the unmoved mover, not a creator. Okay, God does not get his hands dirty by creating a world. God is associated with the world, is, is responsible for the world in a way, but not, um, not as a creator. And also, God does not precede the world in time. It's not that first there's God and then there's a world. They are contemporaneous. God and the world are contemporaneous. So uh, the way that that's expressed is that God is first, not chronologically, but ontologically. Okay, what that means is, is quite simply, it's a question of what's dependent on what. If the universe is dependent for its existence on God, even though they exist for exactly the same amount of time, so to speak, then, then God has ontological priority. We can still talk about God being first, even though we don't mean it chronologically. We mean God does not depend on the universe for his existence, but the universe depends on God for its existence. Well, you know, that's fine for Aristotle because Aristotle doesn't love God. Aristotle's God is not a God to whom we pray. He is not a God to whom we are devoted. He is not a God um, that we associate the term piety with. So he really has it quite, kind of easy. He can simply um, dismiss all the, the thorny theological problems that arise when you try to combine this kind of God, who is the first mover of the universe, with a God that, um, uh, the God of Judaism or the God of Christianity, the God that is the God of religion. So this is not his God. He had, um, his God is, um, as I said, the first, the first mover, the prime mover. Um, but it's also worth saying that he's, he's the unmoved mover. Okay, in other words, if God himself needed to be moved, <laughs> then uh, there'd need to be somebody else who was doing the moving of God, and we still would not have gotten to God. So in order to stop any kind of infinite regress, we stop with God who is an unmoved mover. He moves the universe without himself either moving or being moved. And then of course we ask, well, how is it possible to move something without moving or being moved? And Aristotle came up with a quite brilliant answer to that question. It's possible to move something by being the object of attraction. 
the object of desire or thought. You can just sit there and if you are attractive, then things will move towards you without your having to lift a finger or without anyone else having to push you. So this was his idea. His idea was that God is this pristine being um, who moves by virtue of his perfection and the heavens and thus the universe in general strive towards him in the, in the interest of emulating his perfection. Okay, so by God just sitting there, so to speak, the universe moves and stays constant because God is constant, unchanging because God is unchanging. So Aristotle's universe was always here and will always be here. Um, of course, what we see here is that it's the heavens that are attracted to God, so to speak, and not people. People are not attracted to, to Aristotle's God. It is um, the heavens that are attracted to Aristotle's God. What Aristotle's thinkers want to do is they want to be God-like. They want to be as much like God, okay, close to God in that sense, being like God, not being close to God in the sense of bonding with God. So um, Aristotle's God is also, um, Aristotle asks, what is his nature? And the nature that he assigns to God is that God is pure intellect. Okay, well, if he's pure intellect, he must think, okay? And then what does he think about? Well, there's only one thing that's worthy of his thinking, and that is himself. So Aristotle's conclusion basically is that God is a self-intellecting intellect. He's a kind of a loop, okay? He's not, he, he doesn't think anything else. Think anything else would lower him, would change him. He has to think about the one immutable thing in the world, which is himself. And by his thinking actively about himself all the time, the universe is sustained. Okay, well, this picture is complicated as soon as the God we're talking about is the object of pious devotion. Okay, and that's the problem that we have when Maimonides tries to graft some sort of Judaism, some sort of piety onto this Aristotelian God. Maimonides perhaps tried the hardest to reconcile the Torah with Aristotle. And I think he was, at least my reading of, of Maimonides, everyone has their own reading, but my reading of Maimonides is that he's quite a strict Aristotelian and um, understands the Torah in light, of, in light of Aristotle rather perhaps than the other way around. Um, so for, for Maimonides, the way in which he, the way I think we should say he differed from Aristotle is simply that he loved God. This is not something that Aristotle did. Aristotle had no love for this unmoved mover. And Maimonides has very strong love for the God of Israel, okay, for, who for him is really no different from, I think, no different from, from Aristotle's unmoved mover. So this God of intellect, as Maimonides understands him, God is pure intellect, then the only way to get close to that God, to bond with that God, there's only one way, and that is through human intellect. So what it means for Maimonides to draw close to God, to serve him, to worship him, it means, as I said earlier, to develop one's intellect to the highest level of perfection. And for him, this was the only way to get close to God. It's very hard to understand how you, how you love with your intellect. How you think with your intellect, okay, but how do you love with your intellect? Plato had some idea of this. He had the idea of the intellectual part of the soul or the, the highest part of the soul yearning for the transcendent. He had that sort of idea. My mommy's idea is slightly different. Uh, for him, uh, he thinks about this um, uppercase intellect, intellect with a capital I, as being the object of love of this intellect with the lowercase i, and that uh, what we ought to be doing when we love God is developing our intellect to the greatest extent possible. Does Maimonides God love us? No, he does not. He does not, it's a strictly one-way relationship. We form a, a relationship, a love relationship with God by drawing close to this object of attraction. 
And we can see very starkly here the difference between Maimonides and Aristotle. For Aristotle, it's the heavens that are attracted to God. For Maimonides, it's the human being who strives to be close to God in love. This ideal held a very great attraction for many people. There's a sort of purity about it, um, a love that is not a matter of feeling. Um, it, it might be interesting to, to note that feeling, emotion, was never something highly prized by ancient or medieval thinkers and even some modern thinkers like, like Spinoza, for example. Because um, if we even think about the word uh, emotion or feeling and we relate it to the word passion, what we hear in the word passion is the notion of passive. Passion is something that happens to you. It's not something in which you're active and exercising your abilities, um, realizing your potential. It's something in which you are reactive. Something happens to you. Um, we have the same thing with the, our word affection, okay, with the idea that when we feel affection, we are being affected by something. So there's a kind of vulnerability in the notion of feeling or emotion. And for ancient medieval philosophers, this was a deficiency to be um, emotionally affected. It also renders you subject to change, whereas a perfect being ought not to be subject to change. So to be active, to be in control, to exercise one's capacities fully is to be in a perfected state. So the love that Maimonides advocates is not a matter of feeling, but a matter of raising ourselves to our highest intellectual potential. The demerit of this position, I guess, is, is pretty obvious. Okay, for one thing, it kind of sucks the life right out of Judaism. Okay. That seems uh, kind of antiseptic in that way. And even worse, I think this is perhaps the, the, the most um, unpleasant aspect of Maimonides' view. It limits the number of people who can get close to God to a very, very tiny minority, a very small elite of philosophers. Those who study Torah, those who observe the mitzvot, they have no chance of getting close to God. Um, we'd have to say that, Rabbi, that um, for Maimonides, Aristotle has a better chance of being close to God than Rabbi Akiva. Unless, of course, Rabbi Akiva is a philosopher. That's the only way. So I, I want to uh, close this section about Maimonides by telling you um, the, what, he, what is known as the parable of the palace that Maimonides talks about towards the end of the Guide of the Perplexed. Um, there are 54 chapters in the Guide of the Perplexed. This is part three of the guide, chapter 51. In this chapter, he has a parable um, about this uh, closeness or remoteness from God. And he tells about a king who's in a palace and who is closest to the king and who is furthest from the king. That's the, the subject of the, of the um, parable. Okay, so he says, there are those who are not even in the same country. Okay, um, these people who are not even in the same country, they are those who have no religious belief at all. Maimonides um, calls them, well, compares them anyway, to monkeys. They look like human beings, but they're, they're like monkeys. Okay, they have no religious belief at all. The next group he talks about are those who, um, whose backs are facing the palace, okay? And he, these are people who have false beliefs about religion, false religious beliefs. And he says, these are worse than the first people because the more they move forward, the further they're getting from the palace, okay? So these people are not in very good shape, okay? The third group that he talks about are those who um, don't even see the palace, okay? Um, they, um, they want to arrive at the palace, but they don't, haven't even seen it. And then I, I just wanted to get the quote. These are the mass of religious people who observe the mitzvot, but are not intellectual. Okay, so people who are Torah observant and even who study Torah, but are not intellectual, okay? These people do not even see the palace. 
Okay, they are that far from the palace. Um, in in uh, Guide 1, Chapter 59, Maimonides uh, appeals to the verse Exodus 33, 13, where Moshe says to God, Okay, um, make known to me your ways that I shall know you in order that I find favor in your eyes. Okay, in other words, Maimonides is saying there's only one way to find favor in God's eyes, and that is by knowing him. And he mocks those who fast and pray. Those are his words, okay? Those who fast and pray cannot ever get into God's good graces, only those who know him. The next group of people are those who go round and round um, and... Um, so they, they see the palace, they go round and round it, but they don't get any closer than going round and round. And these, he says, are those who devote their lives to the study of halacha and hold true beliefs, but don't hold them philosophically. Okay, so these people are not getting very close. They walk around and around, <coughs> excuse me, but they um, do not get into the palace. Okay, the next level are those who enter the antechamber. Okay, these are people who at least have tried to prove the truths of their faith, but only those who have attained such knowledge as is possible about God enter the palace. Okay, and then what's interesting is that Maimonides then flips and he talks about kind of who in the secular world um, corresponds to these people. And he has that those who, who study mathematics and, and, and uh, logic, okay, they are the equivalent of those who haven't seen, oh, I'm sorry, those are the equivalent of those who go round and round, okay, and then um, those who, who master physics, they're in the antechamber, and those who are inside with the king, those are the people who have studied metaphysics, that is, those people who have mastered not only the truths of the physical world, but the truths of the world beyond the physical. So, you know, here we see the extent to which um, Maimonides thinks that it's the philosopher alone who really gets close to God and everyone else, those, I, I, you have to imagine that he's thinking those who study halacha um, and, and are not philosophical, you have to imagine that he thinks that these people are very far from God. Okay, so that, that takes us through Maimonides. I want to now um, move to Crescas and I talk about him a little bit. Um, I imagine that many of you are not familiar with him. Am I already talking 35 minutes? Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna then um, try to hurry up a little bit. Okay, so um, Crescas was born in 1340 around and died around 1410. Um, a few years ago, I lost my mind and decided to produce a, uh, an English translation of his magisterial work. It had never been translated in full into English before. His work is called Or Hashem, Light of the Lord. And um, its claim to fame, besides how brilliant it is, is that it's anti maimonidean And for our purposes today, I just want to focus on um, what's really um, important in this um, issue of, of getting close to God. So Kreskas um, had a different conception of God. God isn't intellect for him. For him, God is goodness and love. And therefore, the way to get close to God is through, actually through heart, through feeling, through goodness and love. How does one do that? One does that by observing the mitzvot. When you serve God, you love God. And I think, you know, it's, it's true that for all of us, when we care for someone, when we take care of someone, our love grows. And this is, I think, the idea behind what Kreskas is saying, that when we devote ourselves to God in love, our love for him grows. So when we observe the Torah and the mitzvot, then we, we grow close to God that way, because God is not intellect. Of course, this has the interesting ramification that it's not intellectuals who get close to God. 
in fact, you know, what intellectuals are close to God, <laughs> okay? And also, um, it's open to all of us then to be close to God, because all of us can observe Torah and mitzvot. He points to um, the, the end of the Ashrei prayer, where we say, Tilat Hashem Yidaber Pi, Vivarech Chol Basashem Kachol Yilam Ba'ed, and um, he's, he says there that what we're saying is David HaMelech, okay, King David, who presumably wrote this psalm, is saying that my mouth speaks the glory of the Lord, okay? Um, Yidaber P. Vivarech kol basar shem kacholi olam And all flesh can uh, bless God, okay? So the perfected one, the intellectual, um, King David, as well as the rest of us, we all have a path to grow close to God. Um, okay, since I'm, I'm over my time and my, my wise daughter said to me, no one ever complains if a lecture is too short. <laughs> so I will just, I will just conclude um, by pointing out that the, the figure, the biblical figure who looms largest for Maimonides is Moses. Moses for him is the man of, man of intellect, the one who speaks mouth to mouth with God, the one whose face is illuminated by truth. He's in the light all the time. Whereas for, for Crescas, clearly the person who is most important to him is Abraham, the person of devotion, the person who is called in Tanakh, Ohavi, the one who loves me. And um, that, that kind of devotion that Abraham had that Moshe didn't have, God calls on Moshe, he's hesitant. God calls on Abraham, he goes. Um, the, the fact that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son, all this kind of stuff shows, uh, shows us why Crescas uh, really highlights Abraham as our ideal and why by contrast, um, Maimonides highlights the brilliant and um, intellectual Moshe. Okay, I'm going to stop here and take your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Weiss, uh, for this um, insight and 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 and, and presentation. It was, it was thank you so much. Um, so again, so we open up the the screen now to everyone. You can either um, ask your question in the chat bar uh, right on your uh, right hand corner of your screen, or you can also we we are a nice group. So please feel free also to to ask your question. So uh, let's wait. Uh, you know, a few minutes, uh, one minute or so, and go ahead to ask your question either in chat bar or just uh, ask your question straight. Yes, Sora, first question. Go Hi. ahead. Hi, I, I very much enjoyed the lecture. Thank you. I just wanted to ask if you see any sort of a straight line between Kreskas and the Hasidic movement. I don't think Kreskas would be happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a great intellectual himself. He takes on Maimonides um, purely intellectually. Okay? That is, he, um, he takes on each of Maimonides' arguments and um, challenges them. Not only that, um, but he is very forceful in um, making the point that argument alone is not, gonna, not going to lead us to the truth which is a very radical thing to say okay, to, to philosophers, right? That, that arguing is not going to do it. I can see um, that there is some sort of line. It, it's not a straight line in the sense that Kreskas fell out of favor. I don't think um, the Hasidim at all, um, they find a way to gravitate to Maimonides, which is interesting. Um, it's, it's one of the things at the lecture that I mentioned um, the appropriation by modern jury of Maimonides, um, getting him to say whatever, whatever they, they want him to say. Um, so actually, I, I think what you're saying is, is a valid point. I mean, I think to the extent that Hasidim would um, become familiar with Kreskas, they would find in him a kindred soul. He also has a little bit of, of Kabbalah in him. Um, it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but every once in a while, he'll drop something that makes us realize that he, he does have at least respect for the Kabbalists and, and maybe even is influenced by them somewhat. 
So to, to answer your question, I think that's a very astute observation. And despite the fact that Prescott didn't survive that way, he, his influence waned mostly because of historical circumstances where all the, the um, Jewish communities of Spain at his time were decimated. And so uh, he fell out of favor for that reason. Um, I think what you're, what you're pointing to is, is very worthwhile, that there definitely could be a connection if, if it only happened. Okay. <laughs> so we will rotate between the screen and the chat bar. So we have here from a uh, person is called iPhone. Okay, so iPhone, here we go. How does Rambam explain Yud Gimel Midos? Oh my goodness, okay. Um, it's really not such a hard question now that I think about it. What he, <coughs> excuse me, what he basically says is that all of the things that we say about God are about the world, okay? So um, the world manifests these qualities, but they don't belong to God. Okay, so God's world manifests these qualities, but they don't belong to God. So when, when Moshe says to God, um, show, show me, you know, show me your face, and God says, I can only show you my back, what Maimonides understands by that is that we can only see God's ways, that is the, the effects of God in the universe, and we can't see God. So that's, that's really basically how he deals with it. I'll go back to the screen. Sam Weiss. Just unmute yourself. Great, thank you. That's my husband, by the way. Yes, the one hmm. and only Hazan Weiss. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, did did Kreskas evoke any kind of uh, hostility or protest uh, the way that my monitors did? Yes, as a matter of fact, he was um, thrown in prison in 1367. And um, at first, when I read biographies of Crescas, I, I didn't know who threw him in prison or who, you know, who got him arrested. And it turned out to be the Jewish community. I think many biographies tried to hide that idea. But he, not he, not he alone, but he and his, his two cohorts in the yeshiva, um, they were the three of them were thrown into prison for their philosophical astuteness and their what, what people saw as their deviation from standard tradition. And they were in prison. Eventually, the authorities realized there was absolutely no, there were absolutely no grounds for this arrest and they released them, but they did spend a while in prison. So um, I might mention that the, the yeshiva in which he studied was the yeshiva of the Ran, of Rabbi Nisa, Nisim. And that yeshiva taught not only your standard yeshiva things, but also science and philosophy and Kabbalah. So these were these were renegades. Yes, to some people these were renegades. To us, looking at, looking at Maimonides and then looking at Kreskas, we see what <laughs> you know. How could you possibly say this about the devout um, traditionalist Kreskas? But he he was insofar as he was a philosopher. He posed a danger. So yes, the answer is yes. So, so it's safe to say that those who would oppose Kreskas would uh, call Homer have opposed Maimonides. Right, it wasn't but, like playing favorites one against the other. Right, except that Kreskas um, criticized Maimonides for causing people by his radical Aristotelianism. Um, well, uh, let's put it this way. Kreska says Maimonides was able to be a good Jew despite his beliefs, but those he taught strayed, okay? That is, they, they took what he said and they ran with it and they ran away from Judaism. So Kreska himself was critical of Maimonides in that way. Um, yes, but your Kalva Homer definitely applies. Well, we'll go back to the, to the chat bar we have here from David Mandelbaum. And David is asking the following question. If Maimonides is pure intellect, where does the love of Hashem come in? What seems to distinguish Rambam and Aristotle is love, which is heart, not brain. Sorry, I, caught, I didn't catch the end of it. Uh, which is so? I'll, so which is heart, not brain? So basically, oh, heart, not brain. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So. Um, this really is, is, is at the heart, excuse the expression, it's really at the heart of 
my question of what, what intellectual love of God is. So, you know, as I tried to point out, Aristotle didn't love God. God was just this, the explanation for the constant rotation of the universe, the celestial sphere in particular. Um, but Maimonides, he took Vahavta very seriously. And for him, what his goal was, was to get close to God, intellect to intellect. This was love for him, to, to emulate God as much as possible without trying to, to compete, as it were, with God, to be a, a God-like, but to be close to God, to bond with God through the development of his intellect. That was how he understood love, as, as really not a feeling, but a, a matter of devoting your life to intellectual perfection so that you get close to intellect with a capital I. So we went back to the chat because that's where the next question is. So uh, from Toby Brenneris. So does Rambam believe in prayer that it's okay to ask God for things, good health, happiness, etc.? And does he think that God answers our prayers? Okay, well, the, end, the short answer is no. Okay, in other words, how shall I put this? Um, Maimonides thinks that prayer is important for us. Okay, that it's, it's a way for ordinary people to, um, how shall I put this? Ordinary people need prayer. They need prayer. And so he doesn't forbid it. But his, his preference, that is the highest level one can achieve, is just contemplation of God in silence. He, he quotes uh, the verse, um, uh, silence is praise to thee. Okay, and this idea of um, okay, that is when you're on in your bed, the thing to do is to be silent, okay? That is, contemplation is the highest level of religious um, um, devotion. And prayer really uh, serves our religious needs um, and is not efficacious in that way. God is not in the business of granting favors. God doesn't hear your prayers. God doesn't hear, okay? Whatever you mean by God hears, it's absolutely false. God doesn't hear anything. He doesn't hear, he doesn't see. Um, he's, he's there as the object of our love, but he does not reciprocate. So um, Maimonides is often careful not to go too far, not to alienate people, but um, I, I think there's, there can be little doubt that he does not think um, that prayer is efficacious in that way, or that that's, that that's the way that we should be relating to God. Gimme, gimme. It, it's it's um, embarrassing, I think, he thinks even that, that that's our, our relationship with God. Sorry to say. We have another question from Kelsey Osgood and that's the following question. Okay, does Maimonides only ascribe the ability to get close to God through the intellect to Jews or was this available to everyone? She continues. In Melachim or Milchamot, he writes of B'nai Noach, righteous Gentiles, that if he fulfills them out of intellectual conviction, he is not a resident alien, nor of the pious among the Gentiles, nor of the wise men. Is that contradictory? And then in bracket, Kelsey tells us, I didn't know that off the top of my head. I just read recently, so I had it cl close at hand. Okay, so, so one of the problems with reading Maimonides is that um, he's a little bit cagey. Okay? That is, he, he, he thinks it's detrimental to say straight out um, what he thinks. Okay, so this is a problematic with reading Maimonides and why, why he, it's, um, why there are so many different interpretations of Maimonides. Um, the, best, the best thing that I can, I can say to you is that um, in the parable of the palace, he makes it clear that um, anyone who studies metaphysics and masters metaphysics um, so probably Aristotle is closer to God than Rabbi Akiva, unless Rabbi Akiva was himself a philosopher. And one of the things that, that Maimonides tries to do, in fact, um, 
well, this is this is one of the points that I had hoped to make, but I, I kind of ran out of time. Um, Maimonides turns Avraham into a philosopher, into somebody who proves God's existence rationally. Okay. And he often talks about Chazal as if they were philosophers, but you know, kind of undercover, undercover philosophers. Um, as far as, you know, so so if he uh, it's it's pretty clear, I think, that he was very eclectic. Um, he did not think Judaism was the only way to to go, um, whether for ordinary people or for philosophers. Judaism provides perhaps the best path, um, but ultimately, silent contemplation is open to everyone. And so, as, as much as it it sort of pains me to say this, um, I don't think that um, he would dismiss somebody who was not Jewish um, as um, having equal access to God as someone who is. We have two more questions, so we'll answer, we will have you answer them, if that's okay. One is, so, one is from Janet Scharf, and Janet Scharf asked the following questions. If Maimonides was so devoted to intellect as the way to reach God, does that mean he didn't think one had to observe the mitzvot? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, the answer is that not everyone is an intellectual. Okay, and so Maimonides thought that the mitzvot had different, um, per, a different purpose for an intellectual than it had for the rest of us. For the intellectual, the mitzvot have, I think, I think it's fair to say um, that they are a spiritual exercise the end goal of which is silent contemplation of God. Um, but also, it was incumbent for Maimonides on people who were intellectual, like Moses, for example, um, to set an example. Okay, He did not approve of somebody who was an intellectual taking himself out of the community. But on the contrary, it was incumbent on anyone who was an intellectual to um, practice exactly what the community practiced. For the rest of us who are not intellectual, the Torah and the mitzvot had two different purposes. What, according to Maimonides, one purpose was um, the welfare, what he calls the welfare of the body, which means the welfare of the body politic or the welfare of society. Okay, so it teaches us how to interact with one another. And it also conveys true beliefs about God. Okay, so um, this is this is problematic. I, I don't really have time to go into it, but most of these beliefs about God that the Torah conveys, Maimonides had a lot of problems with. Okay, because if you just read the Torah, you think God has a hand, God gets angry, all those kinds of things. So in fact, a lot, a big part of the guide is devoted to how not to read the Torah as it sounds. <laughs> okay, how to uh, to not learn the lessons the Torah seems to be teaching, but to learn the, the lessons that it means to be teaching, though one wouldn't know it from reading the Torah. Okay. So um, I know I said one more question, but we have to wrap up because we have now also 9 p.m. Uh, meeting. So I wanna take the opportunity to thank Professor Weiss and for everyone who attended you tonight's uh, Lecture with Professor Weiss, and we are, we 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 want to we we want to invite you in person, of course, and we know that uh, uh, you know you you have family and, um, and and you know Riverdale very well. So hopefully, in the near future, uh, we will have you in person in our shul, and we're so excited uh, to to welcome you, your husband, of course, and your family. So on that note, thank you, everyone who uh, attended tonight's lecture. It was very well attended. Great questions. And um, and uh, we look forward to see you for the next uh, Wisconsin Residence of a Zoom, which will be next month uh, in March. So we'll send you more information. So thank you again to everyone who attended and pro thank you, Professor Weiss, of course. My for pleasure. Tonight's, uh, lecture. Thank you so much. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. This is what she had sent you in November of 2021. Okay, I'm gonna leave, yes?
Yeah, yeah, leave. Okay. Yeah, everybody can leave. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Appreciate it. And thank you for the Yeshua Flatbush class, of course, <laughs> that came to be. Uh, thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night.